Well, thank you, Chris, for having me. I'm really happy to be here. This is the second time I've uh, addressed uh, the Collective Intelligence uh, Conference. Uh, first time I was out in Santa Clara. Um, and I first just want to say that I'm, uh, I'm all aboard Tom Malone's bullet train to the future. Um, I would like to attend all future conferences in a, uh, a casual shirt and uh, occasionally uh, repairing out to my backyard to sip some iced coffee while I listen to the speakers. Um, uh, so uh, uh, like Ezra, I'm gonna talk a little bit about who I am and, and why I'm here. Uh, so the first thing I guess I'd say is, is I'm, I'm a journalist and I'm only an academic by accident, uh, more or less, uh, which means that I have different cognitive strengths than a lot of you, uh, as well as some uh, weaknesses. Uh, and uh, I am really good at synthesis. Um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of why I'm here. Our, our, an accident of synthesis is what, uh, you know, uh, has sort of shaped my life for the last 15 years. Uh, I spent most of my professional career at Wired Magazine, uh, and uh, I became really good at looking at forests. Um, but if you dropped me in front of an actual tree, I couldn't tell you if it was a maple or an oak. Uh, so spending that time looking at forests, around 2004, 2005, uh, it became really evident that uh, in sort of the broad world of what was going on in the internet, uh, that collective action was beginning to get coordinated uh, and that people were beginning to create, usually for free, uh, you, know, for, you know, gratis, uh, uh, it, they were producing economic value that had pro uh, previously been the province of experts. Um, and from time to time, the popular press uh, would write about this um, but, you know, it was always sort of, you know, again, you have to go way back to the early days of the internet here. We're talking 2004, 2005. Um, it was always in the realm of, you know, look, uh, uh, silly pet videos are the wave of the future. Uh, you know, they'll replace TV, which, of course, we know isn't true. Um, and it's, it struck me that uh, what people were missing out on in paying attention to a surface phenomenon, like portrayed here, a geyser, um, was something much larger and tectonic. Um, I needed a name for that tectonic thing, uh, and that name became crowdsourcing. Um, the joke about crowdsourcing is that it was, in fact, a joke. What is that? Oh. Um, I, I was uh, brainstorming with my editor uh, uh, about this phenomenon. Really, we we're looking at Wikipedia and a couple other examples. I mean, and there wasn't a lot of concrete uh, examples of collective intelligence uh, at, at that time. Um, and he said, it's like outsourcing to this crowd. And I said, or crowdsourcing. And I was trying to make fun of, uh, you know, the left coast penchant for smushing perfectly good English words together and robbing them of, of proper uh, capitalism punctuation. Um, but my editor said, no, this is really good. And, and he forced me to uh, continue using this phrase uh, in the eventual article, which came out uh, in uh, June of 2006. And it was the first time crowdsourcing was used in print. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a really happy accident from my perspective. Uh, this was something that uh, was a lot of fun to cover. It was really exciting. There was a lot happening really quickly. Um, this was a screenshot taken uh, in the first, it was two weeks before the article came out. And, and even these hits are from people who worked at Wired or people who slept with people who worked at Wired. Um, and this was a couple weeks later. I would have never saved these. Someone in the ad department at Wired did screenshots for me. <laughs> I've been thankful for them ever since. Um, you know, my initial perception of crowdsourcing, looking back uh, from the perspective of 15 years, uh, was, I, I think, very hopeful um, and definitely pretty naive. Uh, and, and also, at that time, pretty simplistic. I mean, we didn't, again, I mean, the, the, the examples I had to use uh, for that article 
uh, were, were few and far between. I mean, when, when we think about the number of people that have come online or have, say, accessed broadband in the, in the last 15 years, uh, it's profound. If we think about the applications that have been built on top of the basic protocols since that time, uh, you know, the change has obviously uh, been profound. Um, so I spent the next couple of years uh, working on a book um, that ultimately led to uh, a year at Harvard and relocating from New York to Boston, uh, and eventually, uh, actually the next year, uh, to my current post uh, teaching journalism at Northeastern. Um, uh, it's been a lot of fun, uh, and I've learned a lot along the way. I, I will say that like any journalist, I've since moved on and I've written about sundry other topics, although uh, broadly staying within technology and culture. Uh, as I do so, um, uh, but really just recently and mainly through uh, uh, Chris Riddle's uh, kind invitation uh, uh, to uh, address the, the conference again, uh, I've, I've come back to sort of examine uh, the landscape, see, see what I, I make of this changed forest uh, in a time of unprecedented crisis. By forest, the metaphor means collective intelligence again. Um, so uh, first, I want to say, ha having spent a few months uh, looking at, at, at you know, wh what the crowd has produced and what it's failed to produce uh, in, in a time of crisis, um, that I, I really agree with, with Tom Malone. I mean, I, I, uh, in fact, I've been uh, bugging some editors to write something, uh, you know, with very much the same premise that, uh, you know, that I don't think there's any question that the pandemic is accelerating certain structural changes. Uh, that were already happening both in the economy and the society at large. Uh, you know, this will undoubtedly have positive and negative effects. Change always does. Um, but from the perspective of collective intelligence and crowdsourcing, I, I, I think and I hope that it's going to be a net positive and that will bring um, an even larger labor pool to the table, uh, both because the current crisis uh, presents a lot of philanthropic motivation I mean, as you've already been hearing today, and as was certainly a theme in my book, which is at this point is long in the tooth, it's eight, nine years old, um, incentive and motivation have always been, uh, you know, one of the major, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, bugbears of, of, of crowdsourcing applications. Um, you know, when is finance, you know, when do you need money? When is money, in fact, uh, uh, offensive uh, to people, and you should be relying on a gift economy. Um, you know, these sort of questions uh, will, uh, you know, continue to, uh, 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 you know, be, be at the fore. Um, but what I will say uh, is that in terms of philanthropic motivation, which has always been a, a, a prime element of a lot of, of collective intelligence examples, uh, you know, no better time than now, right? I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's obviously uh, waxed strongly uh, in a time of, of a pandemic. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other factor that I think should contribute to a rapid development of collective intelligence uh, best practices uh, is, is simply that, that this larger labor pool we have access to uh, now has chunkable uh, uh, labor. Uh, you know, because they are at home, because they are working up remotely, uh, you know, the remote workforce was always, has always been, uh, you know, the mainstay of, a, of, of the crowd, of a crowdsourced labor pool, uh, in that they have, uh, they're able to, to uh, you know, quickly respond to an online query and devote 15 minutes to some mechanical Turk task. Um, uh, you know, I think for the large part, these have been people working from home, and the number of people working from home has now grown uh, you know, by quite a bit. Um, I think when I first started writing about crowdsourcing, uh, I felt as if I tapped some hidden vein, um, almost like a new law within the natural order. Uh, you know, and you, you can really see this sort of po almost Pollyanna-ish sense of optimism uh, in both in that uh, original article for Wired and in uh, uh, the subsequent book, which at this point has been on your screen for a long time now. Um, I'm honestly not trying to, I would rather promote my last book, so I'm not trying to sell books. I just, it's the slide we're stuck on, folks. Um, um, and before I uh, problematize that idea and undermine all that naive and hopeful optimism, uh, you know, which to br in brief is that crowdsourcing was going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
activate all of this latent knowledge and talent that was being uh, oppressed by uh, lack of development, uh, uh, lack of democratic society, norms, uh, governing systems, um, that uh, you know, it would be a leapfrog technology that would reach in and activate all this genius and that we would cure cancer by 2010. I never predicted that, but you know, that was very much the spirit. Um, you know, before I problematize that, I want to defend it. Uh, I, I want to say that despite the fact that technology, mainly via social media, has wound up, oh, you know, uh, threatening our democracy and world peace and all of that, um, I remain convinced that bringing the world into communication with itself, uh, with each other, uh, and, and you know, as the next billion uh, continues to come online, uh, will unleash exponentially more talent and intelligence than we've ever known. Um, I, you know, I, I, I recognize as, uh, as, uh, uh, as one of our speakers this morning, though, that, uh, you know, that gaming the system is, is basically become feature more than bug. Uh, and I think that that is yet one more challenge that uh, uh, crowdsourcing, collective intelligence, um, all, you know, all new forms of, of, of social economic practice, uh, you know, will simply have to overcome. Uh, it's not one I foresaw, um, but uh, it's it's one that is certainly uh, you know sort of on the front burner uh, right now. Um, I still uh, and uh, remain faithful that crowdsourcing, collective intelligence, will eventually lead to immense progress in some of our thorniest problems. Uh, which brings us back to one of the very thorniest of all: um, a worldwide uh, pandemic. Um, I think that, uh, I guess one thing I, I wanna say quickly before, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to get into an op-ed that I wrote sort of as a response um, uh, to actually some conversations with, with, with Tom Malone, one of his collaborators, David Sun Kong, um, but also very much Chris, uh, is that, um, and it's just uh, sort of another accident that I've, I've been spending the last couple of years for my, for my third book, uh, pretty steeped in evolutionary uh, biology um, and evolutionary anthropology uh, in thinking a lot about human history. And I, I, I just wanna say that when you're looking at the fact that something that is, uh, you know, uh, you know as, as Tom in fact pointed out, we can't say collective intelligence is 15, 20 years old. Uh, in fact, we have to say that it is many millennia old, but we can say that it has uh, experienced uh, both uh, great accelerated development in that time, uh, primarily because of things like Moore's Law uh, and the internet. Um, and uh, we can also say uh, that it has come to the attention of us in a way that it simply didn't before. Uh, it's a, a lot of the people in this community will be familiar with things like, say, the Longitude Prize. It's not like the London Times and the Tadler and all the London papers uh, back in the 1710s suddenly started writing about collective intelligence. Um, that has been a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, uh, there's something about spending most of your days thinking about mankind uh, not as a species uh, that has existed since the invention of of, of, of written language, but as, some, as a species that is hundreds of thousands of years old, we think now 300,000 years old, and it's uh, more or less anatomically modern form, uh, that the fact that something that has taken 15 years uh, to overcome uh, some challenges is not surprising. Uh, in fact, it's to be expected, even in our age of accelerated change. Uh, uh, the one thing that I'll, I'll sort of end on, and then I want to get into sort of you know my report from uh, uh, the, you know the uh, you know crowdsourcing and COVID, uh, is uh, that you know I'm I'm a, as I grow older, as I do more research, as I write more books, as I spend more time looking at lots of forests. Um, again, very committed to looking broadly, uh, as as journalists are supposed to do at, at social trends, at social phenomena, um, is that change coming and punctuated in the, in the form of punctuated equilibrium, as we know that as, as evolution itself does, as natural selection works, you know, where, 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 uh, long periods of stasis followed by explosive periods of change. Uh, you know, we see that pattern repeated across the social sciences, um, across human endeavor. So, I, you know, I don't think it's, uh, we should be surprised or that we should be uh, deemed uh, overly 
optimistic to expect that this horrible crisis will also produce bene you know, benefits uh, and productive change. Um, that said, uh, and I'm going to leap in here with, with some problems I feel I've seen. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, I think that, that uh, the pandemic has, and maybe this is part of that progress, uh, has, has really helped identify, uh, you, know, you know, the wrinkles in which we still need to iron out. Uh, okay, so I'm going to uh, present my paper. Uh, so crowdsourcing, it's, and, and I should say this is an op-ed that's pre-publication. Um, crowdsourcing should be a phenomenon that has met its moment. Millions of bright, talented people are suddenly endowed with hours of leisure and a strong incentive to use them for the good of humanity. Many organizations have made an attempt to harness our collective intelligence to help solve the immense problems we now face. NASA has issued a call for ideas across the agency. Harvard Medical School has crowdsourced a COVID map. Just go and let me... It's, it's an op-ed with slides. Is that for new media? Is it going well? Let's skip ahead. Um, Harvard Medical School has crowdsourced a COVID map, uh, which you know I, I want to dwell on just a little bit to point out has has oh, um, has been a uh, uh, it, you know one thing that crowdsourcing has been uh, it, you know has continued in this crisis to be excellent at, which is simple data collection. Um, everyone from the University of Minnesota, your local garage inventor, are trying to hack together open source ventilators. But so far, the kind of breakthrough we've been primed to expect from the internet's much heralded hive mind has failed to emerge. I'm not surprised. I coined the term uh, in a Wired magazine, we just talked about that. Uh, strangers coming together to do someone else's job, usually for little or no financial reward. Uh, the truth is that uh, in its history, crowdsourcing has produced a few successes and plenty of flops, uh, but it maintains its appeal for the simple reason uh, that when it works, it can produce things that are profound and meaningful. Uh, what countless startups and not a few large companies have learned, though, is that the crowd is a finicky beast, uh, and all the right elements need to be in place to make it work. Uh, right now, the crowd is more cacophony than choir, but used correctly, it might just help us develop a vaccine in record time or create an effective system of contact tracing. I, I'm going to put my money on the latter before I put it on the former, uh, for reasons I'll, I'll mention briefly. Uh, but through 15 years of trial and error, there are a few principles that we need to put in place if we are to tap our collective brilliance and goodwill. Uh, first, the problem needs to be well-defined. How do we hack a ventilator is not a question. It's a thousand interrelated questions. When it became clear that we were facing a critical shortage of ventilators, tinkerers around the world leapt to the challenge. Um, but I thought it was really interesting that, uh, you know, the 3D printing, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the father of 3D printing, the, you know, Neil Gershenfeld, uh, MIT, um, actually had asked for manufacturers to provide detailed specs uh, before sort of activating his network of garage fabricators. Um, next, uh, you know, and this has been a theme this morning, uh, today, uh, is that sometimes you need a crowd of experts. Uh, and I'll emphasize sometimes because I think, uh, you know, Aline's uh, points uh, were really uh, uh, well made. That uh, That's not to de-emphasize the role that citizens or, or that uh, all of us play. Um, crowdsourcing is the proven tool for coming up with innovative ideas. We're no longer asking people to come up with a more creative way to sell Doritos. I'm sure you've all watched the crowdsourced Doritos ads. Uh, COVID has presented us with hard technical problems uh, uh, and that we can also come up with incredibly innovative ideas, but to implement them we need experts with immense technical knowledge. Um, finally, and I'm going to skip ahead again because I know I'm out of time. I just, I like this for, ha you know, d defining problem. Uh, one of the brilliant things about uh, COVID near you, which is, again, that's Harvard Medical School's data crowd, you know, crowd data collection effort, uh, has simply just been the UI, the design. Uh, you know, what is the problem is, is, is simply, uh, how are you as an individual feeling uh, uh, the solution is to aggregate the answer to that question? Um, uh, you know, another successful uh, example from the last couple of months uh, is an oncology, and again, um, you know, it's centered around data collection. And where I want to land, and where I'm really interested in my final uh, 
All right, so this is taken right from uh, uh, Tom's uh, uh, collab, the pandemic collab, um, which I'm really excited about and really excited to participate in. Um, and and I, I think Tom hit the nail on the head uh, when when he said that you know the, uh, I, I, you know I'll speak for myself. But I think the best thing uh, that 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 the, the effort from CCI can do is is this recruitment of people and resources uh, to implement selected solutions. Um, and the final point, in my little op-ed here. Finally, for crowdsourcing to be truly effective, we'll need to adjust. Uh, some of our existing norms and conventions. Uh, one of the most promising applications of crowdsourcing involves following Asia's lead and using our phones to help us with contact tracing. Uh, to implement such an operation, Americans are going to have to adjust their expectation for personal privacy. For their part, corporations and academic institutions are going to need to loosen their grip over existing intellectual property and be willing to share the ideas that are sure to emerge from any collaboration of scientists and other creators. Uh, so those are some some interim thoughts. I'll em em emphasize that you know these are early days, uh, regardless of what our administration would have you believe, uh, and uh, uh, and, and uh, you know uh, provisional observations. But uh, it's an exciting time, and, and hopefully it will ultimately be looked back at as as a very positive time for all of us, but also for the field of collective intelligence. Uh, thank you, Chris.